I'm Mary Robinette Kowal, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Mary Robinette Kowal. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. You can find all of the archives of the show over at hankgarner.com. There are handy links over in the sidebar on the right-hand side where you can subscribe to the show. You can find uh, all of the archives in a handy little drop-down list. Or there's a search bar where you can search for your favorite author and see if they have been on the show in these past uh, more than 400 episodes. Thank you to our sponsors for uh, allowing us to do this. And we've got some new sponsors coming on. Daniel Kenny, my favorite middle grade author, is just doing amazing things right now. He is publishing like a madman, uh, but he's putting out excellent, excellent books. Uh, I buy his books for my nieces and nephews uh, all the time. My, My kids are a little older now. Uh, but my nieces and nephews, I buy Daniel's books and put them in their hands. They are top shelf quality and really, really fun books. Uh, there's a link to Daniel's uh, Amazon page in the show notes, and uh, we're going to be highlighting uh, more of his books as we go on this month. But go visit Daniel Kinney and uh, buy his books for your uh, favorite kids, and they will love it. Roy M. Griffiths uh, has a new book, Bringing the Fire, the Lonesome George Chronicles, book two. Uh, Roy is really doing some amazing stuff in speculative fiction, and we're going to be highlighting more of those as the uh, month goes on. But go pick up uh, Roy's newest books. There's a link to it in the show notes. If you're a fan of alternative history uh, or war and military uh, thrillers, you're going to love these books. There's a link to it in the show notes. Also, thanks to my buddies Nick and Jason from Galaxy's Edge uh, for sponsoring the show. Thanks for tuning in. As always, at the end of the show, we have an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. He enlisted for the money. He stayed for the girl. Gateway to the Galaxy, the new series everyone is talking about, beginning with book one, Into the Breach. Frank and Marine Space Corps One find themselves across the galaxy in a WWE SmackDown with the legions of a boss-level villain. But the party's just getting started. He donned the mantle of a celestial knight to impress a girl, well, an empress. Now destiny's calling in a debt. A lightning-paced military fantasy full of outlandish comedy and impossible situations that will have you hailing for these Marines from the get-go. For fans of Green Lantern and the Stargate universe, listen to what some readers are saying. This is good stuff. Thanks for the new obsession. I recommend and can't wait for the next book. And the visual pictures and action are amazing. They're getting the band back together. And this time, it's serious nonsense. Pick up the Gateway to the Galaxy series by Jonathan Yanez and J.R. Castle. Available now on Amazon.com. There's a link to it in the show notes. Gateway to the Galaxy. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Mary Robinette Kowal on the show with me today. Uh, if you are a writer or interested in writing, you probably know Mary's name from the Writing Excuses Podcast, where she is one of the hosts. Uh, but today, we are here to talk about her brand new book called The Calculating Stars a lady astronaut novel, and it's follow-up coming out later this summer. Uh, Mary, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much, Hank. It's delightful to be here. I am uh, really excited to have you. Um, before we get to talking about all the good stuff we're going to talk about, uh, we always start the show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, that's a tricky one. So my <laughs> first memory is... I'll tell you my first memory of wanting to um, 
to write a story. Okay. Uh, which is not the same as wanting to be a writer. Because exactly. I didn't know that one could be a writer yet. Uh, so that is, I am very, this is one of my very, very early memories. I am, so, so in this memory, I am, um, I'm going to guess five or six. I think I'm in kindergarten. And my mom's, one of my mom's uh, things was gardening. And she had the Lady Slipper Garden Club. And so I wrote a story for Mother's Day as a gift for my mom, which involved a kind of space alien or fairy, something like that, who arrived in a spaceship that was shaped like an iris or a lady slipper, and the, uh, the pedals would come down to be the ramps of the ship, and, and then I illustrated it. That is all I remember about it, but I remember how keenly I wanted to get it right to be a story for my mom. That is amazing. Um, I, I agree with you that uh, that wanting to tell stories or wanting to write uh, does not necessarily equate to being a writer in the way that we think of it as, as maybe publishing. Um, I, I, I think there's a, a storytelling gene that's in people and, and you either have it or you don't. Um, and, and you can work at, at – uh, you know, becoming uh, an, an author or publishing and all of that stuff, but that doesn't necessarily equate to telling stories. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, Mary, you you made that uh, that story for your mom, and and you wanted it to be the best it could be. Um, after that, did you uh, was the storytelling thing awakened in you? Did was this it kind of now a part of of your artistic expression going forward? Yeah, so I wrote all through uh, elementary school and high school, um, and like I remember, I wrote the the play that our class did when I was in third grade, and um, and my mom sent me to uh, a summer writing camp. I got really super lucky with the instructor, and I wish that I knew who this woman's name was, uh, but she was fantastic. Uh, so when I was in seventh grade, uh, the summer camp that I wanted to go to was a writing camp. And, uh, and so it was definitely there. And then when I got into college, I I was very much one of those kids who wanted to do everything. Um, and, uh, I was an art major with a minor in theater and speech. So I was still doing storytelling kind of things. I was working on, on a novel that no one will ever read. (laughs) Um, and, uh, and then discovered that puppetry was, uh, was an actual job. Um, and wound up going into theater in pu- as a professional puppeteer and more or less dropped writing for about 10 years uh, because I was still doing the storytelling, but I was getting my, um, my creative jollies from it from theater. And, and it wasn't until I had a wrist injury that I wound up coming back to writing uh, as, a, as a way to express myself. That... Um... Well, a wrist injury for a puppeteer can can be devastating, can it? I was out for two years. Uh, when I, I say it was a severe puppet injury uh, because it makes people laugh. <laughs> yes. Um, but it it was in fact a severe puppet injury. I um, I popped a ligament in my right wrist, Ooh. and uh, uh, during a show, um, and was in a cast for about a year, and uh, and then physical therapy for close to another. Well. Six to eight months after that, uh, just trying to get all of the strength back into it uh, and the rotation. That sounds um, very painful. It was so. The thing that was fascinating about it was that it wasn't. It didn't like it. It. So I was doing Little Shop of Horrors as the giant man-eating plant, um, and we'd done a three-month run, and the show had been fine, and um, and then we we it was like the weekend before we closed and a stunt went very slightly wrong. Mm. Um, Seymour was supposed to, uh, you know, I pick the plant up, I snap at him. It weighs 80 pounds. It hits the ground and then he punches it when it's on the ground and he punched it while it was in the air. It sheared to the side. I tried to control it and something in my wrist went <clears throat> and, uh, and it, it hurt, but I like modified all of, you know, there's so much adrenaline 
I modified all of my operating positions. I finished the show. We wrapped it. We iced it. I did, you know, anti-inflammatories. It was a two-show day. I did the second show, working very hard not to put any strain on the wrist. I had two days off and just babied it. And it didn't hurt that much. And it didn't swell up that much. Um, and got into the puppet uh, on on Wednesday night and and got into one of the small puppets and went to put my hand in and realized I couldn't rotate my wrist. And because I had been babying it, I hadn't realized that I didn't have rotation. Oh, man. That's so brutal. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't so much that it hurt. It was just that suddenly this function was gone. Um, and uh, I would think the emotional toll of that is probably just as painful as, as if you'd have broken it. Yeah, my brain, I remember thinking, oh, something is very wrong. And then because I'm an idiot and the show must go on, <laughs> I did the show. Of course. <laughs> we went, I, got out of, I, like, I got out of the first puppet and like, we're going to the emergency room right after the show. But I did the entire show. <laughs> <laughs> like you do. Like you do. Like you do. Yeah. And that, yeah, that, that was not so much the problem. It was, uh, and I, I, I sometimes wonder what would have happened uh, had it been correctly diagnosed, but they thought it was a, uh, because it, it presented oddly. So they thought it was a cyst. So when I went into physical therapy, and this was, this is really what kept me in the cast for a year is that the, uh, in physical therapy, um, I wound up re-tearing it every day for a month and a half. And, and yeah. that, just that let that was sink the, in, people. Yeah, that was the the thing that that hurts. Uh, and and I remember talking to it, that was a really important lesson about advocating for myself because I have had enough wrist and shoulder injuries in physical therapy and occupational therapy that I know how things are supposed to feel, and I know the difference between um, pain that is because it's hard and pain that is happening because it's damage. And, and I kept telling the therapist, this is hurting, and it's hurting in ways that I don't think it's supposed to be hurting. And finally, finally went back to the doctor and said, I think I'm damaging this. I don't think this is, I think this is getting worse. Um, but it was, it, it's like, I wonder what would have happened had I, had I advocated more strongly. Uh, and when the therapist was, was telling me that, no, it was in the this is hard category if I had pushed harder and said, no, I, I really think this is damage category. Right. Right. Oh man. To, 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 to have hindsight when it's actually, um, useful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, had that wrist injury not happened and I'd been out of puppetry because I also couldn't build during that period because it was my right hand and I'm right hand dominant. Um, if I hadn't had those two years off, I would, probably wouldn't have started writing again. Right, right. Um, I also, and, and this is one of those other things, like looking at the alternate history of your own life. Um, I was get, set to move to Philadelphia to work at a puppet theater. Uh, and I met my husband two weeks before the injury here in, in Portland, Oregon. And and so I, I had to cancel the trip, the, the move. Um, and then it's like, would we have stayed in touch and gotten married if I had moved across country? Oh man, I, I love those little um, coincidences of fate. Uh, uh -huh. the, the things that, yeah, the, the alternate uh, history of your life. I, I, I love that. Yeah. Uh, um, you, you talked about that you were getting your uh, creative jollies. I think is the word you used. Uh, <laughs> you know, through theater, um, and I think puppetry is probably one of the most misunderstood um, mm. uh, artistic forms or expressions. Um, would you just kind of explain to everyone how uh, puppetry, um, uh, how that that uh, that expression uh, maybe use the it. I can't sure. think of how yeah, it, no, what, I, I, what, I'm sorry. Why, what, why, why yeah. it, 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 the intersection. Yes. The intersection between that and what, what is common in puppetry and writing uh, is, I guess what I'm trying to, to say. Yeah. So, um, so the, the classic definition of puppetry is that puppetry is the art of bringing to life an inanimate object. And, what you're doing is a social compact between the puppeteer and the audience in which they agree that this inanimate object is alive. 
uh, which is pretty much the same compact that happens between a writer and a reader, that this collection of words on a page, this, this ink or these pixels, these, these are, are living, breathing characters, and that we create that character in the space between us. There's, a, there's another thing that we say in, in puppetry, which is the difference between playing with dolls and a puppet show is that one of them has an audience. And for me, what, what they have in common is that, that communication, that, that creation in between the two people of, of this shared experience. Um, and, and the shared experience is necessarily different. So my job as a writer or a puppeteer is um, to manipulate an object or words on a page to affect an audience's emotion. Um, I, am, I am effectively trying to hack someone's brain through these, these creations. Right. And so, so that's one aspect of it. Uh, the other aspect, and this is really the reason that I s pretty much stopped writing, is that they, uh, they use the same part of my brain uh, creatively. Uh, not so much performance uh, of the, the show, but the design and creation and, and construction of a show is exactly the same part of my brain that is activated when I'm writing because it's all about world building and character creation and uh, developing a narrative. It's all of this problem solving and fitting puzzle pieces together, which is exactly what I do when I'm writing. It's exactly the same part of my brain. So I've, I've discovered I can perform and write uh, with no problems. In fact, my first novel was written in the green room of a children's television show, uh, Lazy Town. Um, but designing and building and writing, when I'm designing and building a show, my writing productivity drops way off. And when I'm writing, my urge to design and build drops way off. So, so those, um, uh, those artistic forms are, are fully, um, they, they they fully meet your needs at the time. Yeah. Um, that, yeah. that's, that's fascinating. I, I love that. Yeah. Um, so when, when you had to, to stop uh, your puppeteering and the writing uh, desire came back, what were some of the first things that you started uh, exploring and, uh, and what were some of the, the pieces that you, that you finished first? So the, the first thing, that really got me back in was it was, you know, so it was this combination of I'm not performing or, or, or building or anything. Uh, and the other aspect of it was that my brother had moved to China with his kids. And this was in the days before Skype was reliable at all. Um, so, and they were young enough that an email exchange was not going to be something that they were really going to enjoy participating in. And I used to tell them stories. I would make up stories to tell them uh, for bedtime, um, or I would read to them. And reading to them over the internet was, you know, again, not really reliable with Skype. Um, so what I did was I started writing a serial for them. And as I got into it, I remembered, oh, yeah, I used to love writing. I used to love it a lot. And because I had spent my entire life in the arts, the next question in my brain after I like finished writing what turned out to be my first novel after novel zero was, well, how do you, how do you make money at this? Which is, <laughs> is really crass, but, but you know, the thing I had learned from puppetry was that people will pay you money to do basically any art you want. Right. Uh, if you can figure out the avenue. So, so why not do that instead of something you don't want to do? Um, and at the time, the received wisdom was that you needed to write short stories in order to break into the market. Uh, it, it turns out this is not true. This is, uh, it, it actually doesn't matter. Uh, Jim Hines did a first novel survey, and it was pretty much a 50-50 split on people who just dove straight into novels and people who broke in through short fiction. But received wisdom being what it was, uh, I started writing short fiction, um, the first couple of things, my first uh, published short story was not science fiction or fantasy. It's for a great little independent magazine called um, 
the first line, and the premise of the first line is that every story in an issue begins with the same first line. Oh, and that, nice. you know, we, yeah, we say the first sentence is so important, but if you give Call Me Ishmael to Mark Twain, he's not going to write Moby Dick. <laughs> right. So, um, so I started, uh, started doing that and, uh, and selling short fiction and just loving it. Uh, and, and it reminded me how much I love to read short fiction too, because I had pretty much only been reading novels at that point. Um, and it, it was just, it was really kind of, uh, this, this connection to something that I had always loved and, and just forgotten. Um, you said that, um, that the, the received wisdom was, uh, that you write short fiction to, uh, to break into the market and that may or may not be true. Uh, but what about, uh, writing short fiction as an exercise for writers uh, to to learn how to finish something and to, uh, to to learn how to tell a story with a beginning, middle, and an end. Um, do you feel like that writing those short pieces uh, helped your confidence as a writer and helped uh, just in in the mechanics of writing? Absolutely, I, I think that short fiction is is an incredibly valuable tool uh, that that every writer should uh, every writer would benefit from having in their toolbox. However. That said, I don't think that every writer needs it. Um, the thing about so the the thing about writing short fiction versus novels is that there are fractal differences between how a, sh- a short story is constructed and how a novel is constructed. They're the same basic pieces, but uh, but the layers um, you you layer on more and more things. Uh, you get more branches, uh, more visible branches when you're you're doing novel length thing. But the biggest difference between a short story and a novel isn't so much in the way it's constructed, although there, there is something there. Um, and more in the fact that the, the readers are looking for different experiences. And since your, your fundamental job is to, to shape a reader's experience and to shape their emotional, uh, their emotional core for the time that they're reading that, if you don't understand that they're reading for different things, you can frustrate them a great deal in much the same way that if you don't understand that someone who is reading military SF is reading for a different experience than someone who is reading historical romance, you can wind up frustrating them. So that, that was, that was one of those things that, um, the, the writing the short fiction, uh, it, it took me a little while when I, transition to novels to understand, um, like all of my, my, uh, my middles were really strong actually, but my, because the short story is mostly middle. Um, but, but my ends were, uh, and have, have been rushed because my training for short story is you stick the landing and you get out. Right. But a novel reader has been reading for immersion. And so you actually have to ease them out of a story in different ways than you do for uh, for short stories, because you're going for a different effect. Um, the the tools are the same, but you're using them to accomplish a different end. And and a lot of times in short stories, you, you talk about sticking that landing and getting out. Um, sometimes uh, some of the most effective short stories uh, leave things a little unsettled at the end and leave the reader to. Uh, to, to not know everything and, and to leave a couple of loose ends maybe to, so that you can just kind of think about that story for a while. And if you do that too much in novel writing, you will really frustrate readers. They, they really want some closure at the end of that, even if it's part of a series. You know, and, and it's interesting um, cause, uh, because I see short fiction writers do this um, and, and actually do it badly because uh, I, I read a lot of slush um, and, and a lot of student work. Uh, so the thing is that the readers do want closure with, with short fiction, but what they, what they are happy to do is, and, and the difference between, uh, short fiction and, and novel fiction is that the readers in short fiction are aware that because it's short, they're going to have to do some of the lifting, that you're not going to be able to put everything in there. 
And so the assumption is anything that you put in is there because it is necessary to the story. And the things that you leave out are not necessary. Um, and they're also used to, uh, to more implication and to, to kind of filling in the gaps. Whereas novel readers, again, because they're reading for immersion, the, uh, the reaction that they'll often have is if you don't put it in there, then it's because you've forgotten it. And, and so you have a different, different reaction to, to leaving things that are, are not uh, fully explored or explained. The thing that happens with short fiction writers when they, uh, when they leave things uh, unaddressed clumsily is that what they're actually doing is opening a new story question right at the end. And that's the thing that when you read a, a piece of short fiction and it's like, this feels like the beginning of a novel. That's because they've just opened a can of worms and then ended. <laughs> right. And, and, and what, you're, what you're actually wanting to do with this, uh, with, with the type of endings where, where you do leave things, you don't button everything up and you leave it for the reader, is to take the reader all the way up to the point where they have the ability, they have all of the pieces to answer the question, and then you don't actually answer the question for them. Um, so that, that you can leave them to answer it. And it's not something that I feel like every short story can do. It's, it's that when it happens and it is done well, it is because the reader, the, the, the writer has said, okay, here are all of the pieces and this is a giant moral quandary. How would you answer that? Right. Those are the ones that work. Exactly. I, I think a lot of times when, when you have, uh, a, a short story that, that, uh, leaves things undone but in a but done poorly uh, that probably should have been a novel the writer just didn't have the confidence to keep going with it um or, uh, potentially or or they just uh they just needed to pull that story question out um because the thing is that like any story um and i actually do mean this uh pretty much any story idea you can write as a short story or as a novel, and many of them you can write as a short story and a novel. When you look at how many novels are out in the world that began as short fiction, uh, Ender's Game, um, The Ship Who Sang, uh, The Dragon Rider books, Shades of Milk and Honey, which is my first novel that we published, uh, was actually began life as a piece of flash fiction. Um, and, and that flash fiction is more or less intact in the in the first chapter, um, the uh, Lady Astronaut of Mars, um, Ghost Talkers. These were both uh, both had their uh, or, or Calculating Stars, and uh, you know these these all had their their beginnings in short fiction. So I, I do think, like one of the things for me, um, one of the the reasons that I, I continue to play in short fiction is that it does allow me to explore a lot of different. Um, uh, voices and uh, styles and story structures and worlds and and sort of it, it allows me to to play a lot to sort of see oh this this is some place I wanna I wanna spend more time um, and I think that's useful for for writers the other thing I will say to to early career writers is that the deeper you get into your career the more people who do anthologies are going to come to you and say, hey, can we have a short story? And it's a great way to, to build and expand audience, but only if you're comfortable writing short stories. Um, right. It's, it's a great way to frustrate readers, too, if, if you're not uh, doing right. it well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. There's a, there's a thing that we said uh, when I was an art major, which is when you're putting a portfolio together, you're, you're judged by the, uh, the, the weakest piece in your portfolio. Um, and I feel that's that's also true for writers. It's like you know, don't don't send a bad story out in the world just because you can sell it. Right. Um, I think my first introduction to your writing was uh, Glamour and Glass in your glamorous uh, glamorist histories series. Uh, really, book two? I, I think so. Yeah, I, I oh, think yeah. I, I, I think mean, I read that. Then went back and read Shades of Milk and Honey. Um, and I was absolutely fascinated by those books. Um, I, I have three daughters and they are all, uh, in their twenties or late teens now. And we have, uh, read, uh, lots of, um, uh, Regency romance, uh, you know, those, uh, 
uh, type of books. Uh, Jane Austen was the name that I was eluding me. Uh, lots of Jane uh-huh. Austen and, and we just, we loved reading these books together. Um, okay. where did the idea come from to take Regency and add magic? Uh, honestly, it was, it was about as straightforward as you can get. Um, I had just finished reading, uh, a giant epic fantasy and I, you know, I love me an epic fantasy. Oh yeah. Uh, and then I picked up, uh, Persuasion by Jane Austen as a palate cleanser. And, um, and you know, it was a reread. I, this is a book that I love and got to the, uh, the proposal scene, uh, with, where Captain Wentworth writes the letter and just, and I'm just weeping <laughs> and I'm like, okay, wait a minute, let's back up here. Why can she move me with this letter in ways that the giant epic fantasy where the fate of the world was literally at stake did not? And it wasn't that I didn't enjoy the giant epic fantasy. It just didn't move me in the same ways. And, and then I started wondering, where are the small, intimate family dramas where the only thing that's really at stake is, is someone going to be happy? Right. <laughs> and, and it wasn't like in, in Persuasion, it's not even... You know, is she going to wind up on the streets? Is she going to get married? She's going to get married in that book. It's just to who and is she going to be happy? And and that's it. That's all that's at stake. Right. And um, and and yet I have this deep emotional reaction to it. And and so I was like, I thought, what I want is I want Jane Austen with magic. And um. This is before Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell had come out, although there is the fate of the world at stake with those. Um, there, there have been other books. Uh, this is before uh, Sorceress to the Crown by Zen Cho had come out. The, there, there was just a lot of... Um, the, the, these books, I just couldn't find them. I didn't know about uh, Joe Walton's series, uh, and I, I didn't see it when I went looking for it. Um, so, I, so I wrote it. Um, uh, and, and initially, it was that I was thinking about it, and uh, there was a, a weekly flash fiction contest that I participated in, just to kind of stretch the skills. And um, and it was it, so I just you know tossed this off as as a piece of flash fiction. I'm like, oh, oh, I really like this idea. And then I tried to turn it into a radio play. And let me tell you, a radio play about a visual form of magic is. Um, <laughs> Questionable. It's a questionable choice there. I love it. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I I think that's why there's so much uh, so much of in in the uh, the the scene where he's you know making the brook babble in uh, uh, Shades of Milk and Honey. I I honestly think that's part of why that's in there. <laughs> Like, oh, crap, hey, come on. I need something come for on. radio. What could go what radio? can I do? Babbling Brooks. There yes. it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and then I was like, oh, no. Uh, NaNoWriMo happened. I'm like, I'm going to try this as a novel. Uh, let's do this thing. And uh, uh, That's interesting. How far into it did you get in NaNoWriMo? So in Nano, I got fifty. You know, I did my fifty thousand words, and it, it was my first attempt at outlining. Okay. Um, so I had written at, by this point. I had three novels under my belt uh, when I sat down to write Shades, um, and all of them had been pantsed to one degree or another. And this one, I was like, I'm going to outline it. Um, my instinct from the fantasy side of my life was so hard to to drive into the evil overlord. I, uh, I gave into that with Glamour and Glass, but it was Napoleon and he's historical, so it totally counts. Right. Um, but, uh, but like pulling back from that, that fantasy urge to add an evil overlord was really hard. Uh, and, and so I outlined it and, um, and, and as I was getting towards the end of Nano, I was, I was beginning to feel like, oh, you know, I, I feel like, I feel like I want to go a different direction with this ending, um, but I've got this outline, and this part of this exercise is to see what happens when you stick with the outline. So I'm going to keep going, and I finished Nano, and I got my fifty thousand, and I reread what I'd written, and I was like, oh, no, I was totally right. Um, so I chucked twenty thousand <laughs> words, uh, went back, and then uh, rejiggered the outline and wrote to the end because I have to tell you. 
uh, Jane and Vincent did not wind up together in the original outline. Uh, Vincent married Melody, and Jane married, married Mr. Dunkirk. Interesting. Yeah. Sorry for those people who have not yet read the books, but uh, I figure um, <clears throat> if you have read the back covers of any of the others, you, you know who got married to whom. Yeah. And yeah, it's, right. it, it's, you know, in a romance, it's not, that's not so much the question as in how and when do they hook up. So you, you wrote the first book on this just desire to see this type of story that, that you have not or, or uh, you know, that was just not commercially available uh, mm-hmm. at the time. Um, you turned this into a, a fairly big series. Um, did What was the, the reaction um, maybe from your agent or editor when you, uh, you know, started telling them about, you know, I have – I want a um, – I want a story that doesn't really affect the world, you know, very much. Uh, these these tight family dramas, but I also want magic. Like, w- what was the reaction uh, when you start proposing something that is not really being done? So, um, because I was a debut novelist, uh, the the process was um, uh, was was that I had to acquire an agent and editor. So they were, they were buying into the idea of Jane Austen with magic from the get go. Nice. Um, my, so I, I didn't get any pushback or anything like that. Um, when we got deeper into the series, when I, one of the conversations that my agent or my editor and I had, uh, Liz Gorinsky, uh, was that I was talking about one of the things and, um, and she she said, you know, you, you're usually with these books, you're you're dealing with some larger societal issue, even even though it's an intimate family drama. You know, like uh, um, the questions of uh, of of uh, you know, there's like all of these these feminist themes or um, questions of uh, creativity and. Uh, questions of family relations, you know, there's, there's usually some larger societal thing. And I, 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 I don't see that here. And I was like, Oh yeah, sorry. That's not in the outline. Um, uh, but, uh, this is, uh, this is, this is totally set in Antigua and we're dealing with slavery. <laughs> <laughs> right. Maybe I should mention that. I just thought it was obvious because it was set in Antigua that that was kind of going to be, kind of going to be something we sort of talked about a little bit there. Um, but it, uh, but it did. When she said that, I realized, oh, I actually need to make sure that um, that even though that is in my head, I need to make sure that I am actually giving space in the outline for those those thematic things to breathe. Um, uh, and and so, uh, you know, the the uh, notions of privilege and. Um, and and people who don't who don't get their privilege and questioning their privilege. Um, so it's like, oh yeah, I should uh, I should maybe uh, make that a little clearer in the outline because uh, well, uh, if I if I don't, there's a, there is actually a fair chance that I will forget when I'm writing. Right. Well, that's a that's a great point that um, the the story can can get away from you when you're in in creative mode, and it, it seems like a great rabbit trail that you're chasing at the time and then you can get to the end of it and go wow that was a huge waste of time i wish i would have stuck with my original vision and and the you know what it started out to be yeah and so my my feeling on outlines is that they exist they're they're, we use the word outline to describe two different documents one is the thing that helps the writer remember where they're going with the story and the other is a selling tool and the selling tool has to make sense to other people um and the one that the writer is using to help them remember where they're going, uh, that that can be as detailed or disjointed as the writer wants. Um, so, like in Glamour and Glass, there uh, do, you're, uh, there's a scene on a, a sailing ship as they're going from from England uh, over to, to France and then to Belgium. Um, and uh, and in my outline, the entirety of that chapter says. Sailing exclamation point. <laughs> That's it. Really, literally nothing else. But I have other scenes where it's like there's a, a 
I, I know some of the dialogue that happens, and I go ahead and write that down so that I don't forget it and lose it by the time I get there. Um, let, let's uh, let's talk about the new um, series of books, the new duology. Uh, the the new book is the Calculating Stars, and this is a bit of a departure from the the Regency stuff we were just talking about. And I, I know you said early in our conversation that you were a, a fan of science fiction uh, and fantasy, but since you were uh, very small, what brought you to this kind of science fantasy story? Um, and, uh, tell us a little bit about these amazing women, uh, in this book. So I write all over the map in my short fiction. Um, and so the, the story of calculating stars in, in, in terms of how it began, uh, happens actually with, uh, a, a novelette, the lady astronaut of Mars, which I wrote for. A, um, a an audio only anthology called Ripoff, and the premise of Ripoff, much like my my very first sale, was uh, to start with to start with a first line and then write a, a different story. And in this case, we were each supposed to take the first line of a famous a famous first line and our favorite famous first line, and uh, and then write that story. So. Uh, or write a new story, I should say. So I chose the first line of Wizard of Oz. Um, and I, I picked it because it was, um, it was the, my, my first professional puppetry gig was Wizard of Oz. So the first line of Wizard of Oz was the thing that I wanted. And it was, um, oops, sorry. My 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 phone is suddenly making noise at me. Um, that was great. I love that. Uh, so the first line is: Dorothy lived in the midst of a, of the great Kansas prairies with Uncle Henry, who was a farmer, and Aunt Em, who was the farmer's wife. And I knew for audio that I wanted to write something that was first person. Um, and I also wanted uh, I wanted an older character. Um, because I, again, you know, writing things that I don't see often enough, um, older women, uh, don't, you know, older women carry, carry the way of the world and they really don't get enough narrative time. Absolutely. And so I, I wanted, I wanted this older character, um, and, you know, just a bunch of different random things. Um, I... I had already written a story that was in kind of this punch card punk universe. Um, so I, I wanted something that, that had the feel of, of a sort of Bradbury era story. Um, and the thing is that if you've got, you know, if I, if you wind up with an older woman on Mars uh, in the era of punch cards, that means that she went to Mars uh, when she was, you know, in the 1950s. And that, like, how she got there, how that character developed, uh, became very interesting to me. And that's what Calculating Stars was about. Um, because in order to, given, you know, given everything that was going on in the 1950s, uh, given the role of women, given the civil rights movement, someone who was not a straight white male would have to have been extraordinary to get into space. And being extraordinary in that era, would, and honestly still today uh, in a lot of fields, would come with its own set of baggage um, and its own set of damage. And so I, was, I became interested for the novels in, in what that would look like. What would the world be to get here there? And there were certain things that I knew from the original story. Like I, I knew that I had dropped an asteroid on Washington, DC. Um, I, uh, I knew that the space program started faster. Um, but, but there were a lot of things that I, I didn't know and started exploring. And then I started reading about the real women who were involved in the space industry at that point. And again, this is one of those things where um, 
where you you go in to the story and you 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 know the story you want to tell and and you think that it hasn't been written um and then you start looking and realizing that actually it it has it but it was written as real history and and then shoved to the side because it it was not about straight white men um women were involved from the beginning with rocketry uh women of color were involved from the very beginning in the United States uh JPL Jet Propulsion Laboratory had a policy um that for their computer department uh, and by computer i mean a person who computes a mathematician uh for their computer department they only hired women and when you were in the hiring process as a man or a woman one of the hiring questions was and remember this is you know 1940s um uh are you uh are you comfortable working with negroes and if you hesitated if you said no you were not hired um so this is the the assumption that i basically have when i i start writing now is that and especially after this book um i knew it intellectually going into this book um i knew it from from writing ghost talkers that that the women and the people of color are there and they've just been written out of popular narrative and so so with this book um i wanted to make i i went looking for them um and they're they're everywhere uh most of the characters uh most of the secondary characters are based actually all of the secondary all of the characters to some degree are based on someone who was real uh, i got a review there was a, a very snarky review that said that elma seemed too perfect what are the chances that that someone could be both a you know a, a pilot a mathematician and a physicist and i'm like if you look at the astronaut core um actually uh pretty darn good. Right. Um, uh yeah, and I mean like what are the chances that someone could be a science fiction writer, a professional puppeteer and an audiobook narrator? I mean <laughs> come on. Ah, oh, that's ridiculous. Well, and some of the portrayals of astronauts in popular media, uh you know, especially some some movies in the 80s and things like that really portrayed um uh, people as is just kind of cowboys and um they were just risk takers and and that really is not uh the, the story of 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 what really happened and um and and like you said there are people of uh, of every um stripe and persuasion all through the process and and you really have to go out of your way to ignore um everyone involved mm-hmm. and it, yeah. it, it's really crazy Yeah, it is it is really really very much true. Now I will say that the culture of um NASA has changed in terms of the kind of person that they're looking for as an astronaut. Uh in the early days they they were looking for for hotshot daredevils because they were asking them to do something that was completely untested and untried. Right. Um and they so they went for fighter pilots. Um and as the program has evolved what they have gone for um are team players because you know in the early days they were sending people up solo right um and and they were sending them up to to test brand new equipment so not just fighter pilots but test pilots made a lot of sense my father-in-law was a vietnam fighter pilot and then test pilot um and the stories he tells um like just generally are you know So yeah and then you know the engines flamed out and I realized I was going to have to bail out and so I made some notes and then lined everything up and then and I'm just like yeah, what <laughs> And all this ha- happens over the span of 3 seconds and yeah, you're, you're making calculations right Yeah <laughs> you know level the level the plane out yeah it's right. um so so a lot of the uh a lot of the stuff is is very real for for people who are interested in it um I recommend Rise of the Rocket Girls um which talks about the the women at JPL uh Hidden Figures of course which <laughs> Hidden Figures came out after I had finished the book <laughs> and and I was like where was this when I was writing I needed this book so badly um and at the same time so excited like I saw the trailer and I'm like that's my book that's my book 
I'm so pleased. And uh, and also, the other thing that happened, uh, and this is this is really telling about the way we interact with narrative. One of the problems that I had had with my beta readers uh, was that they were saying, "Boy, you know, I I I don't I I don't really believe that." that this computer department would be so diverse. And I'm like, these are all real women. Like some of them, I have just changed their last name. And then hidden figures came out and suddenly all of those comments went away. Right. Well, it, it really tells uh, in, in how we have been conditioned uh, right. in popular media over the last uh, you know, several decades that that people say this is too diverse. No, this this is the reality. We've gone out of our way to make it not so. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah. crazy. So crazy. Yeah. Uh, so the um, uh, the first book in the duology is out now. We're to the calculating stars, um, and uh, we are fortunate because the follow up, the faded sky, comes out next month. Right. Um, what, what the heck uh, happened that, that you have two major releases back-to-back -back that never happens in publishing anymore? Well, it does, actually, uh, but it, it requires specific circumstances. Uh, in this case, what happened was um, they knew that I was planning a duology, um, and uh, they also knew that I write pretty fast and I'm pretty reliable about hitting my deadlines. So my publisher approached me and said, what do you think about doing, uh, doing these back to back? And, uh, and they said, it means pushing publication out. Um, and it, at first they were talking about having both of the books come out in 2020. And I'm like, how fast do I need to have, when do I need to have the second book turned in? So, um, so I wrote them on an incredibly accelerated timeline because I didn't actually want to go that long without a novel coming out, but it's why I didn't have a book come out last year. Because um, I calculating stars, I turned in in October of 2016, so it could have come out last year, but we uh, we held it so that calcul that faded sky and it could come out back to back. The reason is um, it is a well understood phenomenon in publishing that when the first book of a series comes out, that it gets a lot of attention, uh, and that that when the second book of a series comes out, that there is always a bump in sales on the first book. And when the last book of the series comes out, there is, again, there's a bump in sales and people wait for the entire thing. But what also happens, um, so there's, is that there is a drop off in numbers over the course uh, for, for each subsequent book. So book five of Glamorous History is sold significantly less than, than Shades of Milk and Honey. Um, but if you can bring out the two books back to back and it's a complete series, or if you can bring out a trilogy uh, back to back to back, um, what happens is you get those positive effects about for all three books without the, 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 the same giant drop off. Um, and so the theory is that uh, that doing these two books back to back like this um, will get them more attention into a wider audience. Uh, we will see if that actually works. I think, I mean, looking at uh, what we can tell so far, that that is in fact happening. Um, but it is it is a, a brutal schedule. I'll tell you, that, like, I know uh, indie authors who who have books coming out every month. Um, or like three books a year. And I'm like, guys, I don't know how you guys do this because it, the, the writing of the books is, you know, that's, that's tiring. Um, but what also happens is like you turn in book one and immediately dive into book two, you turn in book two and then you get edits on book one and then you turn in those edits on book one and then you get edits on book two and then you turn those in and then you get the, the, the um, copy edits, or, you know, the, the line edits. And it was just like this cascading. My life has insisted of nothing except these two books for basically the last year. 
Well, um, we're happy that it has. Uh, the the uh, Calculating Stars is absolutely fantastic. Um, oh, I, thank I you. cannot recommend it um, highly enough. Uh, I can't wait to read The Faded Sky. It's coming out in August. Um, Mary, what do you hope people take away from these books? Oh, golly. Uh, um, other than a fantastic, entertaining experience. You know, I, I, I honestly, it's hope. Um, we desperately need some of that. Yeah. I, whether that is hope that you can achieve what your personal goal is or hope for, for the world itself. Um, it's, it's really hope. Um, and, and, and the other thing that I would say, and this is on a, a deeply, deeply personal level, um, is, uh, and it, it, it's something that I, I have not mentioned yet. Um, when we, we talk about, uh, you know, I wanted to read Jane Austen with magic, or I wanted to read a book with an older woman. Um, I'm from the South, uh, Chattanooga. Uh, and most of the time when I'm talking, you, you cannot hear it in my voice. Um, there are some markers, but, but for the most part, any, any accent is, is just not there. And, um, and some of that was, you know, I had a speech impediment when I was little. I also grew up in Piedmont, North Carolina, which has a pretty mild accent, uh, Research Triangle Park, so even milder because it was mostly transplants. Um, but a lot of it is that from a very young age, Southerners are, are taught to be ashamed of our accent. And I remember I was in Hawaii, and this is the moment when I decided that I was going to start writing Southern women who were in the sciences. We were in Hawaii and I had been watching, um, I promise this is all connected. Uh, We had been watching local television. And and the thing about Hawaii is that uh, white is a minority there. Um, It's mostly Japanese Pacific Islanders. um, And and so the local television reflects that. It, it represents the local population. And I was thinking about, oh, yeah, what a difference that makes. Um, and then NPR came on, and there was this story about this little eight-year-old girl in Georgia, and she had written a bill to have a state dinosaur declared. And, and it had received some national attention because someone had tried to attack something about God on. And there's this little girl with this, and she is, I mean, like, she, she sounded like my people, like my, my, my mama's people. You know, if I, if I turn on the full bore East Tennessee country <laughs> right. accent, it always makes people laugh, but this is how, this is how a lot of my mama's people talk. Right. And, and so she's talking about, about these dinosaurs and using these, these long words and all of the science. And, and she's like, you know, I love God, but God, God. You know, that, that's, that's beside the point when we are talking about a paleo, paleolithic and just rattles off all of the science. And it made me suddenly realize that I had never heard a Southern woman talk about science and that she had not yet learned to be ashamed of her voice. And so Elma is Southern. And in the audiobooks, I... You know, I, I turn on I turn on what is what is probably my natural accent, which I'm I am attempting to do right now. It, it is hard sometimes when I'm when I'm thinking about it, and it it's not a it's not a huge thing, but I I do twang some, um, and I turn that on for the audiobook, and it's funny how uncomfortable I am still with it that I switch back to whatever this is, uh, for for podcasts because this is the way I speak normally now. You know, this has become my normal voice, my natural voice. And, I, and, and so I think that the, the other thing that I, I would want people to take from it is not, not just hope, but also to embrace who they are and that, that the specificity of who you are, the, the, the circumstances, the background, uh, the pain, the joys, the things that are unique to your culture, those are valuable. And to, to, Don't let society teach you to be ashamed of them. Don't let society teach you to be ashamed of some aspect of self. And what a brilliant thing to, uh, to end on. Uh, Mary, as, as someone from South Mississippi, um, I fully, uh, I I can't agree more. Um, 
And uh, I, I hope everyone goes out and grabs a copy of these books. They are phenomenal. Uh, the Calculating Stars is out now. And The Faded Sky comes out in just a month. Uh, Mary, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for, for just a great conversation, Hank. You ask really good questions. And tell your mom and them we said hey. So. <laughs> I sure will. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. They made instant coffee and laid blankets over a pile of hay. He helped Kate pull off her boots. She volunteered for first watch, but Jason couldn't sleep. Talk to me, he whispered. Kate sipped her coffee. She sat silhouetted against the soft navy sky. A field of stars hung above her. The constellations peered in through the windows and slats. How about a story? Sure. My mom used to tell this one. It's the legend of the star maidens. He watched her words as she spoke, her story illustrated by puffs of vapor that mixed with the steam of her coffee. Long ago... A Mohican brave became lost in this valley. He'd followed a red deer deep into the woods, but the deer had vanished, and as twilight fell, he lost his way. He searched the heavens. He saw a bright star and followed it. It shone upon a clearing in the woods. Spook rock lay at the center, emanating magic. And in the starlight, he discovered the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. He discovered a star maiden. She was dancing with her sisters, and all seven were naked. Oh, really? Jason whispered. Seven naked star maidens? Shh. Why do these things never happen to me? The brave decided he must take the star maiden for his wife. So he seized her and threw her over his shoulder. And she loved him for his courage. They married and had a son. Then what? Then it gets sad. The star maiden missed her home. She gazed at the sky every night. She loved her husband and her baby very much. But she missed her sisters, and she especially missed the dancing. So she snuck away one night and returned to the sacred rock. And she begged her sisters, Please appear. Please appear to me for one last dance. They came to her and took her into the sky. Kate's silhouette swayed. One last dance. It was wonderful. And when the dance was finished, they sent her back to Earth. She thought that she'd been away for only a little while. But that one dance had taken many, many years. She ran back to her husband, back to her baby. But they were gone. Her home was empty. The hunter had stopped waiting for her. He'd given up hope that she would return. He'd taken their child and had left with his tribe. One last dance had cost her everything, and she had no home at all. Jason could sense something roiling inside Kate, some brew of feelings that the story had stirred. He wanted to leap up, to grab her and carry her off, his star maiden, and wife. She climbed up to Spook Rock. She heard no music, only wind. She died there of her grief. She dwindled and lost her star form. She became a will-o'-the-wisp, fluttering between the trees. And see that constellation? The Pleiades. Those are her seven sisters, watching down from heaven. And, to this day, if a girl has lost her true love, she can go to Spook Rock and dance, and the star maidens will bless her. They'll grant her one wish, any wish at all, except one. They can't make her true love return. <laughs>